Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Dylan Grace of the Dylan Grace Blade Company. I've been following DG Blade Co. on Instagram for years now. Initially, it was the neo-primitive aesthetic of his fixed blades that drew me in. He was doing something unique that had a unique look that really captured my imagination. Uh, But also, he was making some unapologetically menacing knives. I had the pleasure of meeting Dylan and his wife at Blade Show 2021, and I remember being thrilled when I rounded the corner and saw a table full of his familiar work. I fondled every knife he brought, asked a bunch of questions, and wound up breaking my absolutely ridiculous no buying knives at Blade Show rule with a Buckeye Burl Beauty with a Warncliffe blade. I'm excited to get into it with Dylan, but first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And while you're there, check out my knife close up videos, Thursday Night Knives, our live stream, and the other great interviews with makers and personalities that make the knife world happen. If you think what we do here is valuable and you want to help support the show while enjoying exclusive opportunities and content, you can do so on Patreon. Quickest way to get there is to head over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Ever strop a knife again, even though it gets no real use? Face up to what you are. You're a knife junkie. Hey, Dylan, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome. So, uh, Dylan, uh, I was looking at your bio on your webpage and, uh, you know, just kind of uh, brushing up on on DG Blade Co. uh, before uh, I was getting in touch with you. And I was trying to find your inspirations and you, you pointed them out right up top. You said adventure. Yeah. Uh, What kind of what kind of adventures? And what kind of adventuring do you do? So I really love anything outdoors, honestly. But I love uh, surfing. And uh, more recently, I've gotten into the overlanding, off-roading kind of scene. Um, that actually happened. I, I used to do a yearly trip with some friends from college to uh, San Diego. We haven't done it since COVID. But, um, and we would go to Encinitas and we'd go surfing you know, for a couple days and hang out in in San Diego. But this last time we went, there was like a ridiculous uh, swell where it was like, I don't know, 16 or 17 feet or something. I was like, we're going to die. We're not (laughs) in shape. We we are not at the caliber. I'm from Florida, so we don't get those. I mean, we get those waves during hurricanes, but we don't really get those waves. So we like called an audible and we rented a Jeep, like a really good off-roading Jeep. And we went the other direction out like over the mountains and into the desert and did some like overlanding and off-roading and camping and stuff. And we like all of us fell in love and had a blast. And we're just, um, we went places that you definitely should not go in a rental car and uh, just had so much fun. So since then, all of us have kind of gotten into that scene more as well, um, which has been really fun. But the adventuring, yeah, I mean, I've I've always been into uh, camping and, you know, doing outdoorsy stuff. So, uh, so is it the desert itself or is it the activity of, of driving four wheelers out in the, uh, out in the wilderness that you like? I think it's the activity of driving cars where they shouldn't be driven. (laughs) It's just really fun to do. Uh, and we, I mean, these were literally, uh, Jeeps. I think they were like nicer Jeeps. I don't know what the Jeep trim levels are, but they're the one, it was a nicer Jeep that like you, is really built for going off road, but I mean, completely bone stock. We got it from the, um, the, the place like at the airport, you know, <laughs> and we, yeah. we like hosed it off at midnight the night before, cause we had absolutely just dis- like destroyed this car and we got our security deposit back. So, you know, here. So. Oh, nice. But, uh, yeah, it's the activity of, of driving in a place that cars should not be able to drive, but can so this is uh something that taps into my um primal love of knives i say primal i mean just in my life like ever uh, ever since you know i was a kid i've i've loved them and uh it's it is uh you know when i was growing up and watching tv in the 70s and 80s you know men and adventurers had knives on their belts you know yeah and and so to hear that that's your 
real um, uh, inspiration uh, kind of makes sense for the kind of knives you make. How would how would you here? I, I was talking about this in the intro. Yeah, this, this Warney scalpel with Buckeye burl is just so absolutely beautiful. Well, here's um, one of those you were talking about in the intro too, as a savage knife. Oh yeah, yeah. I've been watching this happen. <laughs> I've been watching so, this happen on Instagram. Um, so, so what, what, how do you describe this uh, your 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 style? So my my initial inspiration was I wanted to make knives that looked like you found them in your grandpa's attic a hundred years from now. So they're old, they're rugged, but they also have modern designs. That was kind of my initial thought. Um, but I've also really been inspired by kind of like um, cinematic knives and movie knives and prop knives and all that kind of um, nice thinking as well. So I'm, I'm really going for a look um, as well as a function when I'm making my knives. Like I want them to have a certain look and so um, I kind of combined my my past in art and design and photography and all that and then brought that into the knife world. I mean, literally five years ago, I had never made a knife. I just had liked oh, knives no. and I had collected knives, but I hadn't made a knife. Um, and I, I was following guys on Instagram as well. And I reached out to a couple of them and I was like, hey, I'm thinking about making some knives. I'm kind of interested in it uh, just as like a little side thing. And, you know, a, a lot of the community is just really cool and will answer questions and help you out and point you in the right direction. And so th that was all the inspirations going in together. So I was following guys on Instagram. I was really inspired by, I have this love of cinematic blades and cinematic looking knives. I have this history of art and design and photography and all that. And I kind of just swirled it all together <laughs> and started making knives. Nice. Well, okay. So that begs the question, you say cinematic knives. Give me, give me some examples. Well, I mean, like, I'm a big fan of the Lord of the Rings series. Oh, so yeah. there's just, uh, take your pick of cinematic knives from the orc knives to the, you know, the 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 king's uh, uh, sword. Um, I used to remember the name Narsil, I think is what it's called. Maybe that's what it's called. Oh, the Shards broken. of Narsil. Shards of Narsil. <laughs> I, I literally made a, made a blade inspired directly by that Shards of Narsil. And I called it the Narsil. Nice. Uh, so... Um... You, you said cinematic knives. My mind went to Predator immediately. I always loved yeah. that big thing. But but that's okay. So so this is interesting because there are some movies. Uh, there are, here's a great for instance for for my. Uh, so there's the original Conan the Barbarian. Sure. Awesome. Great yeah. sword. Great two swords in that movie. Mm -hmm. And then all the all the backup swords. And then they did a redo in uh, i don't know the 2010s at some point with jason momoa yeah. and the swords were ghastly it was it, they sure. were yeah terribly and he's, he's such a big knife fan too which is why it's such a shame that oh, dude man. is like i he, i've actually sold a bunch of knives to him and he's a huge knife fanatic so really yeah that that makes sense to me a that he's a knife fanatic and b that he would gravitate towards your knives because he was Cal Drogo in uh in yeah. uh, what you call it uh, uh yeah. you know what I'm talking about I, yeah. uh, <laughs> the game of thrones <laughs> sorry i'm getting there, there. We go. yeah uh, he's in that there's this new uh, apple tv show called c that's in its second season and he uses blades from uh neil rpm neil um oh, of okay. instagram slash uh forged and fire fame right. he made a couple of knives for him that are just like spectacular uh you know samurai looking blades and they're both hawaiians it, it kind of makes sense yeah he has the unfair hawaiian advantage i'm just a, <laughs> I'm a floridian i have the florida man people are standoffish so you yo you're the florida man right right <laughs> at, at, from from every newspaper florida man yeah. makes makes primitive looking that's, knives. that's us yep so uh, how do you get the um how do you get this look? I mean, um, do you forge these? Like how, how, they look so, um, so I mean, right they're right. obviously stout as hell, but they also look like they've been used and, and like they've been made, you know, almost around a campfire or something. Yeah. So the, the look of them, like here's one that has really deep pitting, yeah. um, you know, forge pitting in it. The look of them was something I really, wanted to achieve and like uh that was what i was going after more than a lot of other things i was like i had a idea in my mind of what i wanted the blades to look like and i didn't know how to do it so i just kept 
experimenting with different things and different techniques to um, to get to the way that these look. And so a lot of the look is just the forging process, um, but then doing it in a more exaggerated way than you would actually do it, and then not removing any of it. So there's like, mm. there's natural forge scale, which you're gonna get every, you know, every knife maker who forges knives knows that there's this uh, rugged look that's naturally gonna come on the knives. But a lot of like the really high-end knife makers, for good reason, um, uh, grind all of this off and then they end up the finished product is very refined and beautiful and perfect in every way right. and I just really wanted a rugged look so I I experimented with ways to make them look even more rugged than they would look otherwise um, just through the natural forging process so part of it is towards the end of the forging process I will actually put on the anvil um, some of the forge scale that's been knocked off and actually pound that into the blades oh wow for the final part of the process, which gives it this like really deep, gnarly pitted look. And then, you know, once you go through the, the grinding and the um, heat treating and all that process, all of that forge scale that you kind of like smashed into the surface of the blade mm -hmm. will get removed. It'll kind of just pop out. But it leaves a topographical history. Exactly. And so wow. it really is just a, it's a more exaggerated version of forge scale than you'd get naturally but but the the finished product looks like it is like you know forged in the fires of mordor or something yeah. you know it's it's really dramatic and especially on you know some of the more dramatic blades like the one i kept keep holding up like this one is front of the camera this one's three eighth inches thick Jeez. and it's meant just to be absolutely insane it was like let's just dial up the the craziness to 11 in every aspect of it make it super duper aggressive. It has this like epoxy cured Ito wrapped grip, I love but that. kind of done in a primitive looking way as well. So everything about this one is meant to just look like, yeah, you know, like you said, almost you made it um, in the apocalypse or something. Right. I love your, uh, I love the way you do the handles. I mean, you, you have a really wide range of, um, handle treatments you know uh sure. I'm, i i really when i saw this one and and I, I know i talked you and your wife's ear off about the buckeye burl and how coincidental it was that i gravitated towards this and i'm from sure. ohio and this and that but but really um like um you 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 have a lot of different handle treatments you have this which is very contoured and refined and rounded yep. and comfy and then and then a lot of them have that that yeah that sort of i don't know so is that walnut this is actually old uh, bourbon barrel that's been taken apart and then uh, processed and turned into handles. Oh, so nice. I also do an aging on the on the wood to make it look like this because now this looks like, you know, again, like you found it in your grandpa's attic. Yeah. A hundred years from now, it has this rugged old look. So I've developed a process of like aging wood as well to make it fit the aesthetic of the knives. So this is, I mean, because once you... These are old bourbon barrels, but once you process them, it just looks like new wood again. Mm. So then you have to add back in all of that patina into the wood. So how I've done it is I actually take uh, cleaning vinegar, like uh, white vinegar, mm. and I dissolve steel wool into that. And then you use that solution to uh, basically rub it onto the wood. And it's going to make the wood super black. I mean, like the edges are here, this really, really dark and then you take uh, steel wool or sandpaper and you draw back out some of the highlights and it creates an aged looking right. handle. And then I'll use, I have like a really thin um, super glue to kind of stabilize more porous woods. I mean, oak is a pretty hard wood, but it, it's still kind of porous. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't stabilize it first because then you can't get the aging process. Oh, so you right. have to stabilize it afterwards. So this super fine super glue will soak into it. And then I just use a polishing wheel to finish it off and give it that refined look. So is this a process uh, that you've completely kind of invented through necessity? Uh, yeah. Like, I mean, that, that whole thing of melting the steel wool in vinegar and all that. I mean, that's, that's, how did, how did you arrive at that? That I think, I think that I found that one on some uh, forum. I mean, it was always like, how do you, how do you age wood? It was kind of like how I got there. And I think it was someone doing something completely non-wood related. They were making furniture or something like that. Mm -hmm. And they said this, that they had come up with this process to kind of add in that oxidation of the wood. And I was like, I bet that would work for knife handles. Let me try it. But then it was also, so I used the, the wire wheel on a 
uh, grinder. I put a wire wheel on there. Mm. And I'll actually, once I get the blade pretty well finished or the handle pretty well finished, I'll actually wire wheel the handle as well. And it will draw, you can't really see it on these screens. Let's try to get the right angle. But it actually draws out the grain of the wood oh. and makes it look old. It makes it look like it's been used and carried around in someone's pocket for 50 years. So uh, the wire kind of gets into the softer part of the of the grain and removes a little bit of that. And yeah, so it it's gives almost it a, like a tactile. sandblasting it or something, you know. Okay. So it brings out these highs and lows in the wood as well. But all of that, that was like... Literally, I think I figured that one out by accident. I accidentally like hit uh, a handle on the wood and saw what it did to it. And I was like, I don't hate that. <laughs> let, me, let me try to do this on purpose. Uh, you, you also do cord wrap, which I love. I'm, 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 uh, I'm either going through a cord wrap stage or I'm just really just starting to love it. I, I, I do uh, that, that sort of Japanese look. Um, but you recently did that over the aged wood. I like yeah. put it all together. Yeah. I and don't that... have one here with me because I, I started doing, well, the, the last couple of knives I've made have been really thick. Like the one I keep showing you. This one's yeah. a, the three inch thick steel. If you do a wood inlay as well, and then the Ito wrap, the handle just gets so obnoxiously beefy. So for <laughs> these ones, I've started doing a leather inlay. Oh, so yeah. So there's some like aged leather in there and then the Ito wrap on top and it just gives it a perfect, the perfect size, I think. But yeah, I do the, uh, the ones I brought to Blade Show all had, had uh, the wood bourbon kind of like um, core with the Ito wrap on top of it. Yeah, I mean, those to me looked really, I mean, that look is very orc, you know, oh, if, we're, yeah. if we're, if we're going to use that, you know, because it almost looks like there's no mechanical connection there and that you just had to wrap it, you know, with cord to keep it on there. And, uh, you know, it looks like something done out of necessity. Yep. Um, Oh, while we have this up, actually, the very first, I don't know, the very first knives that drew me into your work were um, the Nux, like on the top, uh, the third one on the top row. Uh, I don't know if that's what you call them, but the little knuckle blades there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, have, I have one the, right here. Those things are just wicked. And it was really cool to finally, after years of looking at them, pick them up at uh, at Blade Show and, and really... Um, you know, I think I think something I want to stress right here is that though we're talking about how you you age them, you make them look real, uh, you know, rugged and old. They're very refined pieces of work. You yeah, know, and you, thanks. And yeah, and and uh, you really get that sense when you when you pick them up. You know, and I got a chance to examine. I, I was lurking by your table on and off a lot, and I I picked up everything that was there. Yeah, and um, and. You know, like I said, I, I was planning on not getting anything. And then I was like, well, I can't be here and not get anything. And then that started a whole big tumble. Yeah, um, that's a slippery slope. I it, show. it is um, something something else that you do that I really um, appreciate are your sheaths because, you know, they have the function of Kydex. They really yeah. kind of work like Kydex, except they're leather. Yeah. Yeah. How do you do that? So that was another process that I figured out over, you know, five years of making knives. I wanted uh, knives to have uh, a certain look that, or that, sorry, the sheaths, to have a certain look that really connected to the, the knives as well. And I wanted the function of um, Kydex. One, I didn't have any kind of leather sewing machine or any ability to, you know, with any kind of speed, mm -hmm be able to sew leather. And so um, I came up with the process of uh, wet forming. I actually had a friend who did some wet forming of like a leather hat and some like leather armor and kind of knew of the process a little bit. And I uh, was like, I bet wet forming would work for, for uh, leather sheaths. Like, cause when you wet form armor, like leather armor, it gets really hard. It gets like, almost feels like a plastic hard. Hmm. And so I was like, that's pretty much Kydex. So let's give it a try. And so the process I came up with is I actually, I get the leather from Tandy Leather. I have a Tandy Leather like 10 minutes from my house. Um, and it's like, a, I don't really remember the ounces. I think it's like a six ounce leather. So it's not very thick. And then I soak it in denatured alcohol and um, put it in a Kydex press with a knife in it. And that will form it around the shape of the knife. And then I take it out. I'm gonna mark where I want the 
um, eyelets, gonna drill the eyelets. I'm gonna put the leather die on it, put the glue on it, um, the eyelets on it, everything, um, press everything down. And then I'm gonna put it back into the Kydex press. Mm. And uh, it's gonna form it again, really, like really tight around the knife. And then I let that dry at least overnight. It's gotta dry like completely, completely. Cause you've also done leather dye and all kinds of other stuff. And once that dries, it's it's not hard, like it's not plasticky hard, but it it um, functions really well as a sheath. Here, and let so, me let me hold mine up real quick. Sure. So, so here, I mean, you can you can see like in Kydex, you can see the impression yep. of the blade in there, and like Kydex, you can shake it upside down, and yep. it's not it's not coming out of there, and then it has a real positive lock in you know yep. and and when it comes out you're you're you know using force to remove it it's yep. it's really great actually so i carry a fixed blade pretty much every day and i carry it in my waistband um and like at the three o'clock position and when you sit sometimes there's a bit of pressure there yeah you know depending on how much exercise i've been doing <laughs> there may be more or less but um what i noticed with this is that at, at first i was worried that with leather and sitting that it would it would bend too much around my hip when i was sitting yeah. and that the blade might poke out the opposite side and it's not even a concern yeah. you know it's it's really not even a concern you know after that first time wearing it i was like oh no that's not going to happen i mean yeah. this is like it really has a a a stiff you know i i have a thing for leather leather i just i i really mm -hmm. love leather and i love the utility of kydex that's why you know I, I'm surprised more people don't do this. I think people just don't know how to do it. I've actually done a couple of tutorials on my Instagram now, um, very quick. I mean, I've been doing like these short 30 second videos on like how I do certain different things. Mm -hmm. And with knife makers, for sure, the ones that I did on my leather making process were very popular. I had people asking all kinds of questions and follow up messages and all that kind of stuff of like, you know, like, tell me more about this knife making process or this uh, sheath making process. and and how you actually get that result and honestly it's i can tell you how to do it and then it's just a lot of trial and error as well where you just gotta right. get the get the feel of it and figure out how to do it um the those videos i really really enjoy uh your kind of process videos you did one recently with that push dagger um, yeah. which i i liked a lot i mean it seems like seems like your your work is very uh a process intensive um you know, you do this and then you move over here and you do this and then you come back over here to take care of this. And then you go, you know, there's a lot of moving around. Yeah. And um, um, another video I really, really liked uh, because, you know, I'm a I've, I've, I'm a bit of a draftsman myself is when you took a cigar and you and you cut the end off, uh, you know, and then you you set out to to design a knife. Yeah. And it was high speed of you drawing and designing a knife. And it wasn't just the contours, this is what I want it to look like. It was really like the surface and, and all of the textures and everything included. And, and now it doesn't surprise me to hear that you went to art school or, you know, that you're, that you're a, an, an artist by trade before you became a knife maker by trade. Yeah. yeah I've, I've just always had a, a, I mean, that's literally how I got into making knives was one of those uh, San Diego trips. I was sitting on a beach and I started sketching out knives and the first knife I, I really, sketched out was the one I now call a Tanto Punch, uh, which was my my initial, like, got me in the game of knife making. And it's one of those kind of knuckle knives that you put your finger through the finger hole. Mm -hmm. And uh, that literally got the ball rolling. I was like, um, I bought the most basic uh, stuff to make knives. I had like a Harbor Freight 1x30 grinder. I still have it down there, actually. A Harbor Freight 1x30 grinder. I did the two brick uh, forge where you get two insulated uh, bricks, carve out a little hole and you stick, a, you know, like a, a, one of those little torches through mm -hmm, the hole, mm -hmm. um, you know, a little propane torch. And uh, that's how you heat up the knives. And then I got a little tiny anvil that was like, it was literally this big. Wow. And I sunk it into a hundred pounds of concrete and had that, that was my initial setup and uh, how I started making those. I had like a little drill press that I literally probably spent, I mean, I had no money at the time. So I, I found some camera equipment at a thrift store that I knew was worth more than they were selling it for. I flipped it for like $200 and I'm like, all right, I have $200 to, 
to buy equipment and steel and make my first knives and start my Instagram page. So I did that. Uh, those knives sold to people I didn't even know. And uh, I started, you know, making more on, on Instagram. I used the money to get more steel, started making more. About, I want to say three months into making, I got featured in this, um, there's this like online magazine that you'll see advertised for on uh, Facebook sometimes called High Consumption. And mm -hmm. it's literally like, here's cool stuff you can buy. <laughs> and they they took my like punch knives, my Tanto punch, my mini cleaver knives, and they wrote a story about it. The guy reached out to me through Instagram. I probably wow. had a thousand followers or something at the time. And uh, he was like, hey, you know, can we use your thing for this? I didn't even know what high consumption was. I'm like, sure, yeah, <laughs> let's, let's do this. And uh, with once that article posted, I did $5,000 in sales in 24 hours. Whoa. And my Instagram exploded. <laughs> so I don't know what they were doing running ads with this thing, but it absolutely boomed. And so wow. that was the moment I was like, all right, I think I'm a professional knife maker. Like I'm going to buy a real grinder and a real forge and I have to fulfill all these orders now and, uh, you know, get more equipment. So it was off to the races at that point. Man, uh, social media for as much as I dish on it, um, we all rely on it in one way or another. And it, yeah. it just really seems like, um, you know, uh, for knife makers, it's invaluable, especially Instagram because it's so visual yep. and there are so many ways to tempt potential customers with it. So l let me ask you this. Um, it, it seems like you decided that to start making knives and you went about it in the, in uh, what to, to a non knife maker seems like the hardest way, you know, forging. Um, how did you come to that as opposed to just stock removal? I did my first and, actually the first knives I made were stock removal. Okay. Primarily. My anvil was terrible and I couldn't do anything with it. Uh so but I always had in my mind it was I want this look of the knives and I wasn't able to achieve it with stock removal. I started doing some like acid treatments and stuff like that to kind of pit the steel, but I really just wasn't achieving the look I wanted to achieve. And so that's what led me to like actual real forging. You know, I, I said, uh, I, I think maybe I came across wrong when I just said that, like, I have immense respect for, for the stock removal process I, I have. Uh, and I'm not saying that it's easy in, in any way. Oh, it's not um, at all. <laughs> I, I have a number of, uh, of custom stock removal knives that I love and cherish. And actually they're both, to me, they're two different kinds of sculpture. You know, one, yeah. one is reductive. The other is a little more additive, it seems like, or maybe not additive, but it's a different, uh, you know, when you're forging, you're, you're reforming something as opposed to, um, finding the knife from within, you know, yeah. within that piece of steel. Uh, so I have immense respect for both to me, uh, because I've noodled around with stock removal in my, you know, shed. Um, to me, it's a, it's a process that I, uh, that I at least can extrapolate towards understanding. Yeah. Whereas, uh, forging to me, there's a lot of mystery to, yeah. Uh, how did you how did you learn the forging process and like know what to look for? Honestly, it was just YouTube videos, knife forums, asking people questions and then experimenting. Like trying all along, like in my knife making, I think you're gonna you've heard me say it a couple of times, you'll probably hear me say it again, is I was chasing a certain look and feel for knives. And so that's what kept leading me down the road to figure out different things. Was I'm trying to like I'm like an artist who has something in his brain. He has to get out and I, I can't get it out with my current uh, set of skills. So let me figure out what I need to do in order to make them look the way that I want them to look. And so that's what led me to forging. I didn't even know a soul who owned a forge, who owned an animal. I didn't know anyone who had any, any equipment. So it was all just online. I watched so many YouTube videos. I, you know, if I got stuck, I would ask someone a question. That's basically the, the path that's led me to where I'm at now. Again, just showing how, how valuable uh, social media and the internet is to knife makers. You know, it's also yeah. a little university for anything you want to do, you know, YouTube university. You know, what's um, funny actually is I wanted uh, some of my, I made a couple really big blades that have these deep fullers in them mm -hmm. and I didn't know how to do that. And so, the video I actually found uh, of a guy that showed me how to do it in a really unique way 
was Adam Savage from Mythbusters, who is like a, oh. he does, you know, uh, he comes from like a, a movie prop background and he was making a giant knight sword for some giant knight costume he was wearing to some Comic-Con. And he did a fuller in his night sword. It was made of aluminum, his, his night sword. But he did it with a small wheel of a grinder in a certain way, just like kind of moving it back and forth. And I was like, I bet I could do that because I know how to grind. And once you learn grinding, it's like, uh, it's all like this muscle memory, hand-eye coordination mm. thing. You know, once you get past the using the guides and stuff, I started with the guides too, you know, like the, uh, to, like, in order to get a, a straight line. Cause you just have to, but once you get past that, it's all just feel. So you can grind anything really. And that's how I started doing these really deep gnarly fullers was with this small wheel grinder. So your designs, like the one you keep holding up, what, what do you call that by the way? I actually don't even know what I call this one yet. I think we've called it just like the Ronin Raptor. Ron okay. Right. I remember that Ronin Raptor. So I look at that and, um, to me, um, it it definitely is a weapon. It looks like a weapon to me, though you could use it for gardening or what have no, this you. This is but... just to open Amazon boxes. It's purpose built. Open up boxes of knives. Uh, but so but you also have this adventurer spirit and you go off on these trips. What do you take? Uh, what's your knife when you go out on those? Do you have you made your own adventuring knife? Is this uh, I, I take it you don't bring out a raptor with you? No, I am the classic uh, never keep. I'll, I've made so many knives for myself, but I always end up selling them. Uh, so yeah. um, it would be something more like traditional shaped like this guy here, you know, to right. bring something with me. Something that's like heavy duty. This one you can like pound on the on the spine here to actually use it as like a mini axe to cut through, you know, wood to kind of create fires and camp and all that kind of stuff. Right. And it's just beefy and stout and, you know, it's going to be able to do everything you want to do. And it's a more traditional, normal shape. So something like this is what I would bring. But again, I would make something for myself and then I'll use it for a trip and be like, I'm probably going to sell this. And then sell it off. <laughs> yeah. Someone, someone once said to me, uh, um, oh, it was Jeff Blauvelt. I asked him, do you carry your own knives? And he's like, I don't know. Do you carry your paycheck around with you all the time? Exactly. Like, mm, exactly. Good point. It's really hard to hold on to them when someone else wants to buy them. And, and there's also like, there's also a, has to be a, um, well, I know this from like selling artwork, but there, there is a certain feeling like, wow, this person would rather have this thing that I made than money. Yeah. That is like, I, I can't say no to that. And it's less, it's less about, um, sometimes anyway, it's less about making the sale than it is honoring that person's desire for your work. Yeah. I mean, it's really it's always humbling and strange to me because I never thought it would really work. I mean, it was like, it was like this, um, it wasn't even well thought out. It was just this little side hustle thing that, um, you know, I, I did on a whim and people wanted to buy it and they wanted to, to come and, uh, buy more. I have people who bought like 15 knives from me at this point. Wow. And I'm just like, it's wild. And every time it's wild to me that, that uh, people keep wanting to buy these things. And it's, again, as you're right, as an artist, it's, it feels like people supporting um, my artwork. I mean, I feel like even when I do uh, raffles and stuff, I'm always like, this is kind of like my Patreon. Like if you just, if you want a chance to win something cool and you like what I do, I kind of do raffles as Patreon, you know, as a, as a way to support an artist and what they do. And then you have a chance to win something really crazy, but um, regardless, you're supporting an artist. So. Uh, you did one recently with the, that big recurved blade. Maybe it wasn't recently, uh, but it was up on screen a little bit earlier. And um, yeah, it seems like when you do your uh, raffles, they're kind of a little extra special, the, the knives themselves. It's usually a chance to make something crazy. That's what the raffles are, because it's if I'm going to make something like that for a customer, and I do, a lot of times I'll do a raffle and then someone you know, likes it or doesn't, tries to win it, doesn't win it, and they want one and they'll order one anyways. But it's hard to come up with a new idea that's so like crazy and time consuming and have a customer on the other end who wants to drop you know, like a thousand dollars or something on a knife. Right. But with the raffles, it allows me to really be creative and do big swings on stuff. Uh, 
and you know kind of have a guaranteed amount of like income and people wanting to pay for it so it's not just like uh because i could make those crazy knives and put them up in the web store and they might just sit there for half a year or whatever until someone comes and wants to buy it but right. this way it's i i get to do it and i also think of it as like advertising because it's eye candy you know that's all instagram is is i like you want someone to be swiping and see the crazy thing you made and go wait a minute i gotta click on this and see more about what's going on here so are you full-time knife maker I, I am yeah wow that's awesome what is your what does your day look like it, you get up and you just start forging i wish <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of not fun stuff that going into you know having a, a small business as well there's so many other like um, things that go into it. But I mean, I have a process now that I'll basically make probably around 20 knives a week. Wow. And that will start from Monday to Friday. And I have a whole um, process that's going to take me all the way through from the forging to the grinding to the heat treating to the handles to the leather. to And by the end of it, I'll have these knives made. And sometimes I, I bump it up. Like if Blade Show's coming up, I have to bump it up and you know, really bust it to be able to make, you know, enough knives to bring to Blade Show. But I, I kind of have like a, a rhythm that takes me through uh, a week of making knives. So every day is a little bit different, you know, because if you're doing that many knives, the process is, all right, today is forging day. I'm literally mm -hmm. forging all day. And that day I am <laughs> exhausted by the end of the day. I like, like I can't lift my arm. I'm like all sweaty because I live in central Florida where the humidity is a thousand percent. <laughs> um, I find I actually air conditioned my shop this year. So oh. before this year, summers were brutal in here. You know, I I would probably be ninety five degrees and humid in my shop, oh just my buckets of sweat. But now it gets. I actually left on my my air conditioner overnight and forgot about it. And I came in in the morning it was seventy one degrees. So I was like, okay, nice. Well, okay. So we were just, we just had your page up and I was looking at a couple of the knives. Um, you do some karambit, uh, style knives and there was one up there, uh, called the speakeasy that I've always admired that has a, um, kind of little, a notch. It's, it's a, uh, it's a kind of a cap lifter that yeah. doubles as a sharpening choil, basically. Um, I'm trying to see if I have one here. I don't have that many knives actually kind of quote unquote in stock right now. Right. Do you, do you find that certain types of knives sell more? Um, I, like the speakeasy to me seems like a real practical uh, kind of knife. And uh, yeah, here's the speakeasy pocket smasher. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> cash money. And, uh, and then you, and then you have the, the longer straight edge. But so do you, do you find, you know, you have this, this Raptor that is like so radical and gnarly looking. And then you have something like this uh, speakeasy mini cleaver. Yep. Um, and you know, you, you seem to have a real range from the very practical, like my Warney scalpel yep. uh, to, to the big radical gnarly knives. Do you find that one sells more than the other or, you know, how does, uh, how do you, how do you choose what to make, how much to make and that kind of thing? Yeah, I think um, the the more practical knives definitely sell more because I think it's easier for guys to justify like I'm going to drop a pretty significant amount of money on a knife that I know based on the shape and design I'm going to be able to use every day if I want to. And the good of the the bottle opener, the inspiration for that honestly was we bought this house on a lake here and came to find out one that this used to be owned by Bo Randall, who's like oh, the, no god way. the godfather of knife making uh, here in Orlando. Wow. And uh, he owned this property and like this, this whole side of the lake, basically. And it was like a fishing camp for kids um, back in the day. And I found that after we moved in, I had no idea. And we bought this property because of the shop I'm sitting in right now. It had this huge two-car garage um, separate from the house. And that's why we moved here. So uh you know that was really cool to find it afterwards but the speakeasy part was they used to land in prohibition times on this lake in orlando they would land a float planes on the lake from the bahamas unload them into a speakeasy that was on this lake that would transport them to like three or four other speakeasies throughout orlando and so this lake cool. had a reputation for like rum running and booze and everything and i found that out and i, I always like to take inspiration from like where i'm at in different places and i was like I need to make one on that theme. 
And so that's when I came up with the Speakeasy series of knives that had the bottle opener. And the original ones had the bottle opener and then the bourbon barrel staves as the handles. Oh, nice. So it was incorporated into the whole design. And those just became really popular because one, it's like, it's always great to have a reason to take out your knife. Yeah, yeah. And so popping open a beer is a great reason to take open your knife. So is that one of the, uh, you live on one of the lakes in the Orlando area that's kind of connected to a whole bunch of other lakes where they um, brought peaches up and to the train and this whole thing. Oh, no. Okay. So I'm, I'm out in like East Orlando, which is near the big university here. Okay. Um, they would, they, the, the ones that are all connected are kind of like one where Tiger Woods lives and knife making does not pay that well. And, <laughs> and two is uh, winter park, which is like the, the ritzy area of Orlando and knife making also doesn't pay that well. Okay. Um, so the, the, those are all the interconnected ones or those, that okay. two areas of town is like, there's this like super high end Tiger Woods area. And then there's the normal, I'm a doctor and lawyer high end winter park area. Right. And then there's East Orlando, which is like uh, by the university. Um, so I live in a small, on a small lake out near uh, UCF. And it just happened to be, that was the history of this place is they had a, a lodge called the Echo Lodge that was like a couple buildings. It was almost like a, a camp, you know, like that would be right. used for like a children's camp or something now, a summer camp. Right. But it was converted into the speakeasy and everyone around here knew about it. There's like articles you can find, like these old articles uh, in the, the local newspapers where people would know when they heard the float plane engine that it was on that Friday night. And that is speakeasy. so cool. I love that. And then, and then I'm, I'm a huge Randall knife fan. I, over the past year, I acquired my first two and I, I just, I love Randall knives. Yeah. Um, but uh, so to me that also, God, I mean, your place is steeped with history it's and crazy and not just cool history, like the rum running, uh, which I love. I love the idea of that, but also the fact that Bo Randall uh, owned it. Yeah, he walked these lands, I'm sure, you know. Imbued it with all sorts of good knife-making juju for you to <laughs> That's draw. That's right. That's right. So you, you have channeling. no excuse. You you can't have artistic blocks living there. You just I'm not have allowed. No <laughs> you have I can't no talk excuse. about it anyway. Yeah, I can't talk about it on a podcast. That's for sure. No, no, certainly not. So the the knife business is it is it a um. You know, you you were alluding before to that. You know, you you wish you could get up and forge knives all day, every day, but but that there are business things. Uh, yeah. The knife the knife business in particular. Um, you know, we were also talking before about how cool the knife uh, world seems to be. You know, so many of the people are just great. Uh, what are your What are your feelings on the knife business? Is this um, different from what you've been involved in in the past? Certainly, yeah. I, I mean, I really like it. I I like getting to make knives. It's just the, it's the nitty gritty of business. I mean, it's like any, anyone who has a small business, you're dealing with taxes and payrolls and, um, you know, uh, answering messages and emails and just staying on top of all that stuff as an artist. I mean, I'm primarily an artist, so I have like massive artist brain. So to get me on a task that I don't want to do is, mm it takes all of my energy to do that. So answering messages, answering emails. I'm so, like, honestly, right now, we've had some crazy stuff in our life recently, but like, I'm so behind on messages and emails. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I just like have to force myself to buckle down and do it. But then I'm like, well, I also need to make knives and I also need to do this and also need to do this. There's just, I mean, you have to, there's inventory. There's, I mean, there's so much stuff that goes into it. The stuff I don't like to do. I love making knives. If I'm, if right. I'm forging and grinding and I'm in here focused on that, I'm, I'm in my happy place, but it's all that other stuff that can, can bog you down and get you overwhelmed. So where you, you're talking inventory and I assume part of that, excuse me, I assume part of that has to do with materials. Yeah. Did you run into supply, uh, supply chain issues with uh, pandemic? COVID. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh man. It was terrible. Yeah. First of all, steel has like doubled in price. Oh man. Um, and then I, I had one order of steel. I think it was leading up to blade show where I ordered a couple thousand dollars worth of steel and it just got lost in the mail oh, God. and it took forever to get here. And I had customers waiting on knives and I had knives I needed to be making for blade show. And meanwhile, there's, something like three thousand dollars worth of steel that's just out there in the ether somewhere they the the steel place was cool and they eventually just sent another package but they sent it to the wrong place and 
after it had been delayed for COVID. So uh, yeah, there's definitely been issues. I mean, everything is harder to get like masks. I could, I literally oh, could not buy yeah. a new respirator mask for over a year. Jeez. My respirator mask was like the most grubby, terrible looking thing you've ever seen. Gloves. I couldn't buy disposable shop gloves for over a year. Like, or, or when I found them, they were, I still, I used to be able to buy a box of a hundred gloves for like nine bucks. Now they're probably $30. Wow. Everything has gotten so much more expensive. It's crazy. And, and so you have to, when you're ordering steel, it's kind of like a restaurant, like, um, you know, a steel restaurant, you, you mm -hmm. have to accept, maybe not because your, your steel doesn't spoil after a week, but still you have to be thinking about how much materials you're going to buy, how much you're going to spend on materials versus how your sales are going and, and sure. that kind of thing. That's got to be a nerve wracking. Um, Very nerve wracking. Aspect. Yeah. I mean, it was before COVID, it was really, for me anyways, gangbusters as far as the business part of it was going. I was doing really well. But, uh, hurting on things that for me, Instagram constantly changes the rules where they um, penalize and, you know, I don't, I don't want to be all conspiratorial about shadow banning and all this stuff, but I was at one point growing like a thousand people a week mm -hmm. and I probably grew a thousand people last year. So... It's severely slowed. So um, all of that hurts business as well. I've, I just recently started doing TikTok, even though I'm, I'm way too old for TikTok and I don't understand <laughs> it at all. Uh, I w I've been on TikTok for 2,000 followers. So it's, oh, it's going on over there. The problem with TikTok is every other video they take down because of dangerous acts and you have to appeal it and get it put back up. And it's just, it's, another nightmare process to try to deal with. It's like, I wish they would just consider these knives as art and not let them trying to sell like, uh, you know, military tanks on the dark web or something, you know, it's right, so frustrating. Right. Yeah. I think a lot of, uh, a lot of YouTubers and, uh, you know, just people doing this kind of content have experienced that, uh, um, uh, you know, I, I feel like my growth has always been slow. Um, but yeah, maybe it's shadow banning. Yeah, maybe that's yeah. what it is <laughs> yeah, for me. You, well, you want to believe that, right? You don't yeah. want to believe I'm just not making good stuff anymore. Like right. I feel like I'm making the best knives I've ever made. So, you know. Right. Um, but you mentioned before uh, you 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 buy up a lot of stuff before Blade Show. You make a lot of knives. How was Blade Show this year? Was this your first time or? It was my second time having a booth. It was my first time in the main room. My first first time was in like the overflow room. And I did okay just because I already had a pretty good Instagram following. So people were like trying to find me. But mm -hmm. that overflow room was kind of rough. Like there just wasn't as many people who came through there. I was like tucked away in the corner. People were like, I've been looking for you all day. I'm like, I don't like hearing that. That's terrible. <laughs> um, so I love uh, the spot I had this time was great. I love being in the main room. Um, and Blade Show was good. I mean, we, we had a good show. People I talked to who were regulars were saying how it was like not nearly as many people as normal, you know, non pandemic times. Um, but I had a really good show, you know, enjoyed it. I'm planning on doing Blade Show West in LA cool. uh, in October. So uh, this is definitely the first time I've done that. Um, so I'm excited about that. I have no idea to, what to expect, but I'll be there with a bunch of knives. If people are there, come see me and buy my knives. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was really cool when I saw you there because this was my first time going to Blade Show and I was totally overwhelmed and just loving it. it. I mean, just, oh my gosh. I mean, I could have been there. I was a I was a shark in water. I just could have been there, you know, for several other days. Yeah. Um, but I'm just going back and forth around the tables. And when I saw your work, I was just like, oh yes, you know, I, I wasn't I wasn't actively seeking you out. I was only really actively seeking out people I had already spoken to on the show. I wanted to meet them, shake their hands. Yeah. And then when I saw your work, it was like a jolt. I was like, oh yes. So it was it was really cool to uh thanks man to see you there. And I loved your setup and you had so much work there to to check out. You had these double edged sort of dag sort of um asymmetric uh, asymmetrical daggers asymmetrical meaning like the top part wasn't the same as the bottom. Yeah. And man, those were so cool and and uh, just a lot of really cool work. And um, yeah. Thanks, so uh, do you do custom stuff? If someone says to you, I want, uh, you know, a Filipino style sword or something like that. Is that something yeah. that you do? 
Yeah, I do. So usually in a given week of those 20 knives, probably like five of them are custom, you know, orders from the past. Uh, so I'm, I'm always, you know, that's, those are all the messages I need to get back to are people right. who are wanting custom knives and most knife customers are really cool. And they, they, they recognize that, you know, one, a, you know, a time quote I give you is relative and they're just patient, which has been right. really cool. Some people aren't, and it's understandable too, because they're used to Amazon and they ordered a knife and they, <laughs> they wanted it two days from now. Right. Um, but, uh, for me, customs are always like a little stressful, just trying to stay on top of everything. Uh, cause I need, if I don't have that handle material, I need to try to get it again. It's all those little details that go into, you know, it's usually someone who will message me on Instagram and then they'll have 10 pictures of knives I've done in the past that they really like. Like I want this on this and this and this and this oh and this. And I'm God. like, oh, <laughs> okay. Um, Give me 80% of your uh, speakeasy and 13% yeah. of, yeah. But again, most customers then once they get it, they're, they're very, they're blown away and they love it. And, you know, it means a lot to them that they got to get it just how they wanted it. So that I love being able to do that too. You know, right. I, I remember when I was, uh, before I really started making knives, I had this idea of not what I wanted a knife to look like. Oh, actually, no, I was, I was hiking, uh, with my son and we got these, um, uh, railroad spikes mm -hmm. from a, like they had been kicked off of a railroad. We were hiking along a railroad. And I picked him up. I was like, I want to get these made into like a knife for me and a knife for my son. That'd be such a cool thing to have. And I kept going to all these different guys trying to get them to make them from these things that we found on our trip. And, you know, I, we were in uh, Asheville, outside of Asheville at the time, North Carolina. And I couldn't find anyone to make me anything. And I was just like, it was almost like a catalyst to start making knives because I couldn't find anyone to do it who, who was willing to take it on. Wow. Well, I just got an idea about something <laughs> about you making a filipino knife for me some someday in the future let's do but, it let's do it um <laughs> uh, boy i got distracted there uh so tell us tell everyone how they can get in touch with you and and what the best way is to uh you know we know you're busy but uh we also know you love making knives so what's the best way for people to get in touch with you to to get your work or to set up a custom job or yeah all of that? um Instagram, DG Blade Co. You've at DG Blade Co. Just search DG Blade Co. You'll see me there. Um, you can message me through Instagram. The, that's a good way, but you have to be persistent just because like, there's, there's 60,000 people on there about who follow me and there's lots of messages. So I get backed up and the Instagram system's not the best. So you can lose messages in that as well. Mm -hmm. And then also you can do um, you know info at dgbladeco.com. You can go to my website, dgbladeco.com and click on, uh, you know, how to send me a message. You can send me a message from there. Uh, those are probably the best ways to, to be able to get a hold of me. And something very cool. Uh, when I was on your, your website, you do have, you know, a, a very select group of knives that are available, you know, yeah. and, and, uh, and that's, that's pretty cool because, uh, oftentimes people don't have that kind of capacity. Um, but, but, you know, you've got a couple of those, uh, Raptors that you've been showing up there. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a couple of really cool karambits, uh, nice. one with a, with, with a hawk bill blade that, that is just really, really cool. I can't remember the name of it now, but it's the one with that really great acrylic handle. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. And then, and then you have a couple of the Nux and you have, uh, you have you have you have a small but but diverse smattering of your work available right now, which I think is which yeah. is great. Yeah, that's I try to to keep um, some things stocked in there, and that's again what I'm making every week. There's a percentage of it that's just going to be dumped onto the web store. If there's a big knife show coming up, there's a percentage that's set aside for the knife show, and then there's a percentage that's customized. It's kind of what every single week is looking like. But I also just like making new things. I mean, it's like the artist in me. I don't just want to become a manufacturing process for a certain type of knife. I love, I like the creativity of, you know, sketching a design or just having a design in my head and going in the shop and making it. So I usually try to do at least one knife in a week. That's just like something new and something to kind of explore creatively. Outstanding. Well, Dylan, thank you so much for coming on the knife yep. junkie podcast. It's been a real pleasure meeting you and, and talking with you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This has been, this has been fun. Awesome. Take care. Yeah, you too. Ever visit the knives online in the hopes of satisfying your need to possess them in the real world? Then you have a problem. You are a knife junkie.
There he goes, Dylan Grace, maker of my prized warning scalpel. I really love this uh, this sort of rough hewn aesthetic, but so refined in the uh, in the actual um, making of them. And uh, boy, talking with him, I did get a couple of ideas about the kind of things we could make together like these Filipino swords a little bit. Anyway, uh, if you like this show and if you like other shows like it, check us out every Sunday right here for uh, great interviews with really outstanding people, artisans, artists. Also check out the Wednesday Supplemental Show where I get to show off new knives and talk about new knives that are being released. And then, of course, there's Thursday Night Knives, my favorite night of the week where I get to meet all of you, whether it's in person online or in person through the comments, and we get to check chat and talk knives. So for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast